Okay, are we ready? I never got to uh, okay. share my socks, so I'd hope I, ha- <clears throat> I want to be included in this episode. Well, share your socks right now. You can go first. Steal his thunder, Mickey. He has very nice socks. They're all the right color. They're, They're- Bombas. They are definitely Mickey Mouse. And at the top, Did it you see does Mickey have, there, Jer? I see Mickey. He's there. Yep. Very nice. What do you Thank got you. over there? Um, you tell me. What do I got? Breakfast food. I have, uh, looks like uh, eggs and bacon and toast, <laughs> orange coffee. juice and coffee. Cheerios. All good stuff. And butter. Butter. A lot Look of at butter. that slab of that's butter. A- so that's how we started the show tonight. So <laughs> welcome to another episode of uh, Check Out Our Socks. Oh, I'm wearing the Grinch, though. And we have our our holiday uh, sweaters on. Justin is lighting up all our lives. You are wearing the Grinch. Yeah. I see. I'm wearing my Hanukkah uh, sweater. Nice. And it's all about the eight candles. What's the, it say? The eight days. Uh, you'll, I can't read that way, so you have to tell me. Come on, baby. Light my menorah. <laughs> Light one of my candles. That's a little dirty too. Yeah. Well, it's all, it's all, it's all where your mind is at. It's all in the frame of mind. Hmm. Okay. Wait, wait. Is this the uh, second holiday episode that we've? Uh, well, we don't. We don't have any holidays. Quit false advertising us. Well, did we have? No. I thought we. This one comes out on Monday the nineteenth, which is the first day of Hanukkah. Fantastic. Here Let's we are. do this. Do share. Let's do this. We are skipping the week of the 26th for the for the holidays. 26th is the day after Christmas. So mm-hmm. we're skipping that Monday. But we will hopefully, depending on if we can record in Minnesota, be back the second. So for you guys, if you have any holiday New Year's show. Yeah. If you have any holiday horror stories or any conflicts that came up during the holidays, write in yes. then and label it like holiday theme for us. And we will try to put a holiday show together. So write in. Yeah. Keep those cards and letters coming in. Yeah. All right. Imagine if they're all handwritten and you had oh to type them out. You would never, you guys would never <laughs> we would get not to, get any. We would <laughs> never get through them. <laughs> not going to work. Okay. So, up first on our realistic expectations theme. Hello, wonderful people. Trigger warning, animal neglect. I'm writing to get parental perspective and general advice on how to talk to my parents regarding the neglectful way they treat their pets and an outside opinion about when more serious action is needed. My parents currently own four dogs and two cats with litters of foster puppies and kittens rotating through, all except for the oldest dog where foster fails meaning foster animals that ended up being adopted to the foster family. The oldest dog was adopted when I was in middle school. I'm now in my late 20s, and the dog I grew up with is about 18 years old. A long life for a rescue dog. The issue I'm having is from my perspective, my parents only care about the newest animal, meaning the puppies and kittens get the most of the attention. Then the three new dogs, then the cats, and my sweet old dog gets none. When my parents talk about their pets, they frequently say, our three dogs, and I have to remind them that they have four. They don't take the old dog outside at all, then she eventually pees inside. They then yell at her like it was intentional, and also blame their other dog's indoor accidents on the old dog. Every time I've visited them since moving across the country, I haven't seen either of them interact with the old dog, unless it's in a performative way, where they get where they get my attention and make a big deal about it. The old dog has a lot of medical issues and is mostly blind and deaf, completely toothless, and has other health issues. One of my parents makes jokes almost daily about how we should just put her down, as if her life is inconvenient for them. When she had her last surgery, me and my siblings discussed how we were okay with her being put down if she no longer has a good quality of life. Then we let our parents know we just wanted what was best for our dog. She had the surgery and is still functioning, barely, but they keep using the phrase, you, my siblings and I, weren't ready, and diverts the decision back to us. My parents also remind us that she is, quote, your dog, and say one of us was supposed to take her when we moved out. Having only lived in apartments my adult life, I've never been at a place in life where I could own a dog. 
Visiting them as an adult has become a very triggering experience. Visiting them as an adult has become a very triggering experience. From the smell of urine and feces to the stains on everything, it has gotten to the point where I have to stay in a hotel nearby when I visit. My family has a very passive-aggressive form of communication where no one really says what they want to. People pleasers. I don't know how to start this very serious conversation with people that revert to the silent treatment and nervous laughter during any confrontation. I need them to realize they are dangling the life of our beloved childhood dog in our face as a passing joke. We've asked them to stop fostering and focus on the dogs they own, and it just becomes secret fostering where they didn't tell me and my siblings about it. The dogs have had multiple medical emergencies from getting into the trash and recycling, and it's heartbreaking to hear every time because I know I need to intervene more than I have been. I know this is a lot, so any advice is so, so appreciated. This is a tough one because, you know, we are faced with this ourselves with, you know, we got Holly who is 15 years old. Actually, we, we thought she was 16. Uh, we were off a year. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, all. I didn't know that. We told everyone on the show I too. Know. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> but the bottom line is that, you know, for the most part, she's doing great. However, she is getting hard to hear. She's and, deaf. And she's got some tendon issues going on in her back legs. And... You know, for the most part, she functions. Yeah, fantastic. She, she runs around. She's doing great. And I had a discussion, not so much with you, but I had a discussion with Carla, and I said, you know, we just we need to know where we are because if she starts having, I mean, she's always going to the doctor. I mean, there's constant, you know, vet bills. She's high maintenance. We'll put and, it that way. And mm -hmm. the answer is, is that if it gets to the part where her quality of life is going to suffer, right? We are. We're not going to put her through it. We're going to, you know, give her a way out. And as hard as that decision is, because it's controversial. I mean, people say, well, what happens if, if you become hard to deal with? My answer is, put me out. <laughs> it's okay. So Time to get Jerry out. I was well, going to say, yeah. you are hard to deal with. <laughs> you, have, you have a few people out there that might that might be a little upset with you with that one. They like me. If you come live with him, <laughs> I invite it. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> I invite all of you. You're all mine. Anyway. Yeah. So, back to this one. So the answer really is, is that, you know, the, the fact that your parents say that that dog is your dog and you really see the quality of life with this, this animal is, is challenging for the, for the animal as it is. And everyone's taking everything out on her anyways. Maybe this is the time to not make her suffer to the part where she gets worse, that you allow her that exit and give her that dignity. And that's that takes, you know, takes this one off your shoulder. As far as the other animals and what goes on in that house, you know, there's a thing called animal control. And it's a state-run, you know, uh, department. So all you need to do is let the state handle it, call it in, and let them come investigate these people. And if there's an issue, let the state do it, and you're out of it. And they don't. The state doesn't say how you got there. They just say we we've heard there's animals here. We're checking on it. We're just doing our job, and let's see what goes on. It's no different than when people are you know working. They have wage and labor issues. You go to wage and labor. They, they'll, they'll take your report. They go in. They don't ever say how they got there. But they take care of the problem. So if there is a continuing issue, then let Wade, let the uh, Department of Animal Control, you know, deal with your family. You don't have to, but you've certainly solved the issue with the dog that you certainly gave, the dog that gave you their life. And now you owe something to that animal to make sure that animal has dignity. Because as much as, you know, you love that animal, that animal obviously has loved you very much. So that's the way I see it. That's, that's this father's advice. Animals are incredible. I mean, from all, all the videos I've seen, all my experience with animals, just everything. Animals are just from dogs to horses to even animals that aren't considered pets. It's amazing how these beings can take abuse 
and go through such trauma and such horrible things, but still can have such a will to live and such a find such happiness in the end if mm-hmm. they're able to get out find, of that. Yeah. get out of the situation, have the right owners and stuff. So mm-hmm. I just it's very emotional for me the whole like animal abuse and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But in this case, there is an interesting dynamic in life where there's a pet that's, you know, raised with kids that kind of is under the presumption that, oh, like this may have been a foster pet or whatever, but when you guys grow up and you guys leave the house, one of you will take whatever. I There's no excuse ever to leave a, like a, a dog like this uncared for. You have to spend time. You have to do things with the dog. You have to, ah, but I think that this is common where a pet gets neglected because people feel as if they, they didn't sign up for it and then they got, they, they have to take care of it. So they think that the minimum of taking care of it in the most basic ways of food and shelter and water, whatever, is justifiable because they didn't sign up for it. Which these people seem to be like weirdly dog and cat obsessed where they need to be surrounded by these things and have constantly have more even though they don't have the capabilities to take care of the ones they mm-hmm. have. I don't know. I, I do know that when you know we have we have an animal that we we share. And it takes a village to raise an animal. But that animal typically is busy all day long. I leave, I go somewhere. I go to I go to the airport. Holly's with me. Yeah, I do something. That dog is always having action. Gets walks, gets played with, gets you know whatever it might be. A lot of people work though, and they like, ca- can't and, take their dogs. But sometimes you really have to wonder if you really are set up for an animal. And that's the question. That. Yeah, we, the husky. You bet. The COVID you, pets. Oh, yeah. I just remember the husky one that the dog was way too much for the rider. And and I do need to go do a a small uh, introduction to what Krista is doing with these animals from Riverside. These dogs that with oh the ones that are on the kill list. Yes, we'll have to go figure out what this all is about. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's shelters all over the country that have kill lists. So I think fostering is super super important. It gets animals out of shelters that are high stress for them. Um, the minute me and Justin move into our house. We're fostering. You guys will meet foster dogs coming up soon um, because we have a house that we don't care if a foster my, dog trashes. My my friend Kenny. Before the renos. Kenny used to foster um, greyhounds off the track. Yeah, I've fostered in Minnesota for an organization called Secondhand Hounds. And it is it is amazing fostering, but you have to be equipped for it. And these people are not. And, you know, we recently had to put my dog down and he was only 13. He developed stomach cancer and was like had a zero red blood cell count because he was like bleeding internally and miserable. And right. then the next day he would get up and be running with us. Like he went from 100 to zero so fast. Like the day before we had to put him down, he was running alongside me and the horse. And it was just like, well, what are we doing? Yeah. But two days before that, he couldn't even get up off of his bed. So... You know, it's really hard, but when I hear that this dog is 18 and has had mm-hmm. a beautiful life, you know, your parents are putting this blame on you. Take the decision out of their hands. Mm-hmm. You and your siblings maybe are going home for the holidays. And I truly believe like your dog, like you describe, isn't in the best of health. Like she's barely making it. And I think you're doing such a service to your animal when you let them go on a good day mm-hmm. and not a bad day. Mm-hmm. I do too. And so it might be time to take this decision out of your parents' hands. They want to throw it in your face that this is your dog. You guys weren't ready. Well, maybe you're ready now. And take, maybe you should make this decision as hard as it is. If and, and the dog together, is ready. And do it with your siblings. Take yeah, the- absolutely. Be, like if you guys are all coming together, it's the perfect time to like be able to say goodbye to your dog in a meaningful, happy way. Take it to McDonald's, get it a big ass cheeseburger. But I will say on the maybe mush it up since it doesn't I, have teeth. I will I will re say this one more time. Far as the other animals go, don't even get involved to try to tell your parents what to do because 
They're not going to listen to you. No. All you need to do is go to the State Department of uh, Animal Control or, or the county and let them do their job. Also, if you know what rescue or organization they're fostering for, contact that organization anonym- uh, anonymously. Make a Gmail, make an email account that's not associated with you and write them a tip that, hey, you have a foster that does not have adequate, healthy, sanitary conditions for the pets you have them placed with. Make those emails to the foster organizations because they're not going to fuck around with that either. And, and and your parents, when they when they have someone on their tail, will, will make one of two decisions. One, they'll give up the animals. Or two, they're going to clean up their act and find a better way of taking care of the animals. Yeah. There'll be a defined expectation. So either way, you win. Yeah. And so I picked this one too, just because of realistic expectations. Like this is one of those situations you have to go into kind of with realistic expectations. Like your parents might not change, but like, what else do you do about it? Mm -hmm. And you laid it out perfectly, like contact animal services, whether that's animal control or the local, whatever, or the foster group. And Mm -hmm. I think that's all you can do because it sounds like you've told them that they need to get their shit together and they they're, they they're not listening. No, they don't care. Okay. Thanks so much for that write in. Yeah. Putting animals down fucking sucks. Putting animals down. Ugh. I I went through it once with you with the horse and I that was the hardest thing in my life. I know, it's very very one. hard, but I also look at the dog we didn't put down and it definitely wasn't despite him going on his own. It wasn't. Rue? Yeah. He, he. Rue needed to be put down. And, you know, he, I think he wandered off to go die on his own and then ended up like getting hit by a car or he was adventuring on his own and mm-hmm. got hit by a car and then he dragged himself home. And it's like, he should not have had to gone yeah. to go through that. And then we, we went the other way with Bear. Like we let him go on a good day, which is how you should do it. And then, I mean, it can turn into something beautiful too. Like I still really want to do the diamond with the ashes. And yeah. Then, then it like, you know, they live on forever, but it's, you know, you got to know when you get a dog, you know that that's a part of it. Some people don't. The amount of videos I see on TikTok from people dropping their elderly dogs off at the shelter because they got a new puppy. I Trust me, if I had yeah, a nickel, that's a whole different... if I had a nickel, I'd have 50 cents. The videos I see are horrendous. Those people should be blacklisted from ever getting a dog or a pet ever again. Give them a, I don't even want to say give them a fish. They don't deserve a fish. I got to go to the next one. Okay. Let's roll. I'm struggling to stay in my lane, but still draw boundaries with my mother-in-law. I, 24 female, have been with my partner, 23 male, for a little over two and a half years. We've lived together since the beginning of the pandemic, over two years, and we've gotten really close with each other's families slash parents. His parents are divorced and both remarried, but his mother, who's in her mid-40s, lost her husband at the end of 2020 due to COVID. My partner was able to graduate from a top university with zero debt because of his generosity. Anyway, my partner's mother has struggled with alcohol abuse in the past, but in the sort of way that she always drinks socially with friends that enable her and she would black out and drive herself home. Before he passed, her husband spoke with my partner and his brother and said her drinking bothered him and that he wanted to bring it up to her. But weeks later, he passed away. Her alcohol abuse and mental health issues got worse following his death, understandably, and she spiraled really hard. We live about three and a half hour drive away and both work and have pets. So we couldn't up and leave to go support her other than during holidays. However, my partner's brother had recently graduated high school and started community college and chose to take a year off of school to support her and help her grieve and cope with her husband's death. They've both always been close with her as she had primary custody of them most of their life. I also grew close with her and formed an immediate connection and she would tell everyone that I was her daughter while it's taken a turn for the significant worse. She's gone from being an irresponsible parent and holding things over her kids' head to outright gaslighting. She has access to my partner's bank account. He never removed access from when he was a minor. And she wrote herself a check 
for $1,800 from his account without telling him. It's worth mentioning that my partner has struggled to find a job since he graduated in 2020 and just recently got a full-time job after being part-time and barely above minimum wage for two years. When he noticed the missing money and confronted her, she denied it, then later just apologized without saying she would even pay him back. My partner later found out she did the same to his brother, who is currently in college with zero income. On top of all of that, she's recently been seeing a man that none of us know who she claims, quote, saved her and knowingly says this to her youngest son, who sacrificed a whole year of his life to stay home and support her during a time of grief and mourning. She texts my partner and his brother, expecting them to be happy for her and her toxic life choices, then becomes angry when they are unresponses slash apathetic because she's hurt them so many times. She lashes out, then reaches back out later like nothing happened. It's a vicious cycle. Most recently, she told them she wanted them to meet this man, and when they were unresponsive, she became angry and sent a huge block of text to them. She said that they're ungrateful, and this man has done more for her than they have, and she's decided to cut them off, and they have 90 days to take over their cell phone bills, car payments, and insurance, etc. Obviously, this isn't an issue for my partner and I. We have the means to do so, but she's leaving her 20-year-old son with a half-finished degree and loads of monthly payments he can't afford. My partner would always acknowledge the issues she had, but was definitely one of the biggest enablers for most of his life, since he was the eldest and is the glue of the family. But he's hit his breaking point and has basically had enough of her shit. He's creating distance and supporting his brother in doing the same. My struggle is knowing how to draw boundaries when it affects me and my relationship versus when I should stay quiet and just make sure my partner feels supported. There have been multiple times that my partner tries to clean up her messes and ends up putting a strain on our relationship, but it's hard to draw boundaries when it's his mom. He's gotten better about drawing boundaries specifically for his own sake, but I'm worried that eventually she'll come back and apologize and it'll just happen all over again. How do I make sure I'm being a good partner during this family stress? How do I toe the line between being supportive of him stepping up for himself and not making him feel like I'm ragging on his mom all the time. Well, I have a, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions. There's an inconsistency. If she's got money paying all these bills for them, why is she taking fourteen hundred dollars from A and taking fourteen hundred dollars for B? It doesn't make sense. So there's something goofy going on. And if in if in if when the father died, and left the son money to go pay off his his college. I'm wondering if did he leave money for the other brother as well? I have some additional info. Wait, wait, wait before you know, I want it. But also it sounds like she's out of money and that's and the money and she is actually putting up a show saying I'm cutting you off. She's not cutting off. She doesn't have the money where she blew it. Whatever mm-hmm. it was, it's gone. It's definitely a show, but his school, so our writer's partner, his school was paid off before the stepdad died. I see. So additional info for background, my partner's stepdad was financially well off, but was a very humble man. So he only spent his money on his wife and her kids and loved them like his own. They were married for about 12 years and my partner and his brother genuinely saw him as a second father. He had prior health concerns and was about two decades older than her. So they had obviously discussed what would happen if he passed and what that would look like for her. She hasn't had to work since they got married. And he told her that he would make sure she never had to work another day in her life if she didn't want to. He had her set up for life, but she made no lifestyle changes and even started living more extravagantly, flying all over the country and claiming it was to honor him. Now, a year and a half later, she's blown basically all of the money and was forced to get a part-time job and is using this as a part of her reasoning to cut her children off. But of course, she isn't taking responsibility and makes it come across as the world being against her or it being everyone else's fault but Mm -hmm. hers. Mm -hmm. Well, I I figured that one out. I called that one pretty quick. So, father knows something. (laughs) You know a lot. (laughs) You know a lot. We just needed a good title. I love that one. 
But, uh, you know, it's very difficult when you're dealing with an addict. And she's an addict. And far as the guy that she's with, he may be supporting, he may be a, a contributing factor to her being an addict. He might just be an alcoholic himself and the two of them drink themselves into oblivion and travel and do whatever it is. And I'm sorry for that, but until she gets um, gets to the part where she she is on the bottom, they can't get her out of it because she's not going to listen. She and Or if they get her in a day that she is sober and, and you can actually have a conversation with her without her being defensive because that's the first thing that happens with people that are addicts. It's hard. It's hard to deal with them. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I was friends with somebody that their brother was an addict and I would watch stuff that went on. And before really recognizing what was going on, you know, they, they may have needed help with money or this. And I said, sure. And I would, you know, sell 50 bucks or 80 bucks or whatever it was. And it was stupidity because all I was doing was supporting the habit yeah. and not anything else. So I learned the hard way. It's a tough thing to get away from. So I don't really, you know, far as you, it's you and your brother and you just have to just kind of step back. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard to intervene, to do, to have an intervention with her because she's not receiving the intervention at this point in time. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know even what it would feel like to see a parent stealing money from you and also cutting you off because of their own financial issues and their frustration with that. And that the fact that they can't pay for anything else anymore, they're now taking all of that out and doing this show of, it's just smoke and mirrors that, in front of you to say, "Hey, that's just I can't do it anymore." So that, that's the alcohol and that's the insecurity. It's all the things that come. It's all the negative stuff that oh. comes with that whole thing. So it's a bad gig. All you can do is really is is get everything out of out, out of the ability of her touching it, right? And get your own control and tell her you love her. But you know that there's a problem. It's tough. That's really tough. Yeah, and she created it. Yeah, right. But at the same time, you're just like also in that position as a kid to see someone like a parent to you or to see someone as a parent mm -hmm. go through that, your first inkling would be like, okay, I need to help. Mm -hmm. And it'd be, it's, it's hard to find the balance of where do you set the boundary? But, but they also have to recognize it and, 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 and help as well. Look, I've had tough times. There's no doubt about it. Morgan's watched me have tough times. Morgan's been there to help me through some of my tough times. It's not easy for for her to you know to see her father go through issues. Yeah, you know it. But it, we as parents, always, it's different because when we take care of our kids, they they're brought up that way. They're never reversed to know that they sometimes have to help their parents, and it it it's it's it's. it's it's an emotional stress. Now, it's wonderful when they, everyone comes out clean and everything goes forward and things you know turn around, but sometimes there are difficult times. But when you're drinking and you're causing this issue because of the alcohol and the addiction, that's a, that's a, that's a bigger problem. Yeah. You can't even have a conversation. Right. Well, in that, I, I understand the role can flip and the alcohol is playing a part. And I think the line gets drawn when your help is not really being seen as help. It's being just taken advantage of mm -hmm. to the point where they have to take money without, you know, they're literally stealing. So it's they like, are. it's, I mean, do you start with figuring out the alcohol thing? I mean, where the do you- alcohol, The alcohol, that's the beginning. The beginning is actually probably having a conversation that we, we get the problem. Let's just put it on the table. Yeah. And this is how we got here. And mom- you know, you had a fun time. You, you, you know, dad died and you, in order to compensate for grief, for the grieving, you spent money. You literally anesthetized yourself by having a party for a year and a half right? to get through the party. But now you went through it all 
and now reality is here. So now deal with the grief the right way and let's find a way to go forward to rebuild our lives back up. Yeah. So the listener is actually more talking about not how to handle the Mm mother-in-law, but more about how to handle this dynamic with her partner. Right, right. And so it's more about like, how do I maintain this boundary of like being here and being supportive of my partner and also not ragging on his mom to where he feels like I'm just shit talking or his like his mom. So the ideal outcome is I would love for my partner to feel empowered to basically give her an ultimatum that he's not willing to include her in our lives if she continues treating them like this. I want to be supportive and build them up to understand that they don't owe her anything. Mm -hmm. She is their mother and it's her responsibility to love and to provide for her children and that she is in the wrong for holding these things over their heads. I'm glad you got me back on track. Which to kind of where you were getting at, I don't think necessarily I'm not sure like like exactly you know what she's holding over their heads but if she is struggling financially and now her son is 20 yes he made a sacrifice to stay home a year and Mm -hmm. help his mom and do this and do that and that is so kind to do for your parent but at the same time you are 20 and if your parent can't afford to pay for your phone bill anymore there's got to be some give and, and take here. Like there's got to be a breaking point because as hard as it is, which I get, I totally get where our writer is coming from, where it's a parent's responsibility to take care of their children and not the other way around. You kind of just said the opposite, where sometimes the children might have to take care of a parent. She is right. She can be no, be, be, all of a sudden she can be the nag who's trying to touch on a very sensitive topic when it comes to protecting his his mom. Because he obviously loves his mom. She raised him. I, I get all that. I think the answer is, is that if she can have the conversation where she says, you know, God, I hope that we can help your mom, but this might be it. I think maybe we should also go to a counselor and have a counselor advise us how to really handle this with your mom. Because if she says, this is how to handle it, it's going to, it's going to, it, it may not be taken with the sugar that you're intending it. And if it comes from the counselor, don't shoot the messenger. And if you're the messenger, he may shoot you. It's going to, it might affect your relationship and your intimacy. And that's the last thing you want to do. You want to be able to support him, but, and help him find his way through it. But let the therapist who is very, very clever. They've been trained for this to help deal with that situation. Yeah. And I think like to her question and how do I draw the line? Like you draw the boundary for yourself because you're the only person you can control. Mm -hmm. And so that's where you say, you know, based on the way your mom is treating all of us, I don't want to be around your mom anymore. Like whatever you do with your relationship, I'm here to support you because I love you and I'm your partner. However, I don't want to be around your mom anymore. I don't want to offer your mom any financial help. And if you guys share an account, highly recommend separate finances. And they may not share. And they may not. But every, I think everyone should have their separate finances and one joint account for coupley things, house, whatever. For ease. But I think like you are the only person you can control, and so you have to draw your own boundaries, and then the decisions your partner makes you can support him but then that'll come to the point where it's like am i happy with the decisions he's making is he respecting me and our relationship by the choices he's making Mm -hmm. or is he putting us at risk and causing conflict with us trying to save his mom and then that's where well and that's where you can go to your partner and say hey you know what this is becoming an issue i want to establish this boundary for us you are hurting our relationship by continuously putting your neck out for your mom. We need we need to do something different. Couples therapy, absolutely. I, I would Hands say, down. I would say by going to the therapist, it's going to take you from being the heavy. And you right. don't need to be the heavy right now. No, but I also think I also think he might need individual therapy. It is 
But the therapist will see all this. The therapist will see all this. But couples therapy and individual therapy are two different things. It's like it's like driving a it's like riding a bike and driving a car. It's two very different things. Mm -hmm. And so for someone who you got to get you got to get tires for both. Well, that's not the right example. Then it's like riding a horse (laughs) and driving a dump truck. Okay. I don't know. Whatever, whatever two contrasting things. They you both can... have horsepower. And they both get on a road. <laughs> exactly. They're similar, similar, but not the same. It's all transportation. Um, but it does sound like his mom has always kind of been this person that I'm trying to find the exact word. Um, well, didn't the alcoholism happen really after? Or it was, and, and it was after? a little bit before the... The husband was concerned about it, wanted to bring it up, but he passed, unfortunately, mm-hmm. before he could. Um, she's So here, I found what I wanted to talk about. She's gone from being an irresponsible parent and holding things over her kid's head to outright gaslighting. And I think for, you know, obviously, a lot of our listeners can relate. Mm-hmm. Like, a lot of people have those parents that are manipulative and just not really great about respecting their boundaries Mm -hmm. and we've all we've all been there and it's hard like even even drawing a boundary with a parent that's tame can be difficult it can cause conflict it can leave you with a parent that's guilt tripping you and making Mm -hmm. you feel like shit now add on this additional layer of this lady who's an alcoholic lost her husband not financially stable setting a boundary is going to be world war three Look, like I said, this is I, I we've experienced this in our own family. So that's that's why I think he needs individual therapy though, because he's grown up with a mom who doesn't sound like she's been the healthiest even on her best days. I get it. And so it might help him I get it. really I get, get on it. track to being able to set boundaries. Because yep. he probably hasn't learned how ever. I'm just my biggest thing is to protect her and the relationship. It's great to be her, you know, to be her, to be his partner and to support, you know, and be there as a backbone. But don't be his therapist. You can't be, and let him. Let he he needs to go and as well to discuss how to implement to to assist his mom with having her the guidance to how to deal with this problem with her. Yeah, individual therapy would do that. And I think it would make his relationship with our writer mm-hmm. healthier off the bat. I think so. But so maybe it really isn't as much couple therapy as the fact that he's got to get therapy, how to deal with his mom and, and take direction. Yeah. I, I think that. honestly, I think it is a combo of the two. I would say it's a cocktail. It's a cocktail. It's a, uh, <laughs> it's a cocktail for two. <laughs> has a, <laughs> it's family a that's, you know, mom starting with alcohol. It's a cocktail. It's a cocktail. Um, but yeah, two different things. But because their relationship is already strained because mm-hmm. of her, I would say couples therapy as well. Okay. I think we've we've covered this one yeah. pretty good. Yes. All right. Well, let's go to the next one. Why is it called a cocktail, by the way? I don't Have know. Have you ever thought about that? No. That word? I'm not even It working. could be horsetail. I'm it not could a, be flytail. But it's a cocktail. Why? In some old taverns, the last dregs of booze from the barrels of spirits, <sighs> known as the cocktailing, were chucked together and sold off cheap to drinkers who would call them for cocktailings, later shortened to cocktails. Huh. There you go. Hi, guys. I first want to say I love this podcast and Two Hot Takes. I'm hoping to get Jerry's advice since I am seeking dad advice about my relationship with dad and Morgan's since she has Jerry as her dad and her biological dad as well. Justin, of course, chime in. I, 23 female, am trying to get advice on how to handle my relationship with my dad, 52 male. Some background information on my family and my relationship with my dad. My parents, mom, 50 female, and my dad got divorced when I was four. So it is all I've known. My mom got into a relationship with my stepdad when I was five or six years old, and he has lived with us as long as I can remember. They got married when I was 13 or 14, and he has always been a father figure to me. My dad growing up wasn't around much, or when he was around, he was the fun dad to make up for when I didn't see him. He would choose his relationships with other women over me and my brother, 16 male. I wanted a relationship and wanted to spend time with him until I was in high school. 
I went to his house on the weekends when my mom made me or when the holidays came around. I now only go for holidays where extended family is, so I am not alone with him. I am now 23, as I wrote, but now I don't want a relationship with him or more of a only see him at Christmas type of a relationship. A couple of months ago, I went to therapy to talk about my relationship with my dad and how to set boundaries, but that was only six sessions as it was free with my insurance. Now onto the question, how do I set the boundary of only wanting to see him at Christmas? He reaches out to me sometimes, and recently I've just been ignoring him since I'm not confrontational at all. What is y'all's advice on setting that hard boundary? If you have questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much for reading my letter. Well, it is very clear, and this is from my point of view, Morgan's going to have her own, um, that you are where you are because of the relationship and the dynamic of what you guys have experienced. So he owns part of this, very much so. So I think that when you have a dialogue with him and, and, and you're honest with him saying, look, this is the relationship that we have. This is what, what our relationship has been. And this is where it has led us. And it has led us to the part where I am not feeling the love that I really want to be around you. There, we have an issue. Now we have two choices as adults. We can head look at this problem and find a solution for it if we can, if if we can find the interest to do it or we can for right now just go into a hiatus and let it go it may change in the future but right now i don't have the energy to keep investing into this relationship that to me isn't a healthy one when when you have this discussion with him he can recognize how how you got here and he can either own up to it and realize it because it, it does take two to tango or not tango. And maybe you guys can figure out how to save this thing or you can let it go responsibly and, 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 put, it, and put, it, put it away. I mean, I think that this is the last ditch effort to try to have this communication to see where you guys can go with it and, and what his interest is. Um, do you feel that you have to have a conversation? Well, it, she says, how do I deal with that? I mean, you, you, if you want to just go cold and just not answer them. You just don't address it. <laughs> you know, you know I, she's, a, she's asking a question because I think that she cares. Yeah. So if he, she cares, then you have the conversation. If she's already beyond caring then you just quit answering them and you just don't put any effort into it. And if, and then when he finally says why later, if he even does, then you address it. But I look at this that everyone knows, you know, they're transparent about what's going on. We are going to let this relationship die because it's there's no investment either way and neither one of us care anymore. I don't think you care and it's got me to the part where I don't care. So let me so ideal outcome is only seeing my dad on Christmas I will say this is my life um I have two dads this one sitting here and my bio dad I grew up where the interactions with my bio dad were very forced it was the holidays or when my mom would make the effort to like arrange time for me to go over there and when I got into high, like high school, it literally became just a Christmas relationship. And over the years, he's tried to like maybe make more effort. Um, it's in the past couple of years became a, I see him during Christmas and our yearly family reunion during the summer, but that's it. I think like, you know, he definitely reaches out, but no matter how much like your bio dad reaches out, it's not going to go anywhere unless you contribute in. So if you only want to see your dad on Christmas, you can already have that by the effort you put in. I personally, and maybe this is an unhealthy way to deal with it, and maybe a conversation is more appropriate, but with my dad, I would never have a conversation like this where I would say, 
I'm only seeing you on Christmas. The relationship I want with you is an only Christmas relationship. Because for me and my dad, that would cause World War fucking three. It would. He would say, well, you're an ungrateful piece of shit. Like, I don't I don't know. I don't know what he would say, but I I know he would be hurt because so what's, so what's wrong with the with with the with the the way that I approach it by saying we have an issue. I don't well I don't think there is an issue. It just depends. For her it's an issue. Well, no, because our writer our writer doesn't see her dad much as it is anyways. I think it depends on what communication level they're on. Yeah, I I I think we get like really caught up sometimes in like I need to address this. I need to outright say this. And we preach that on the show. We preach communication and having these conversations. But depending on your relationship, you might be able to just get away with seeing him on Christmas without having that conversation. You're 23 now. You're an adult. You choose what you do with your time. And so that's kind of where I'm at. Like, you, like I was an adult. I got to choose what I did with my time. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to see my dad, I could see my dad. So it naturally led to that, yeah. right? It naturally kind of through the invites and whatever, the events that happen, yeah. it naturally found its way to be that, yeah. which is what you're saying. Yes. Whereas if it is a different type of communication in their relationship, mm -hmm. it it may be a more direct forward thing that says, hey, you know, I've been feeling X, like you've said. So why, so do, it, why I, do, why do we, I got a question. Why do we not say to a person like this, maybe you guys need to have there. If, do you, if she already made the decision not to want to continue the relationship other than Christmas, then you're right. Just show up at Christmas. Show up at Christmas. Well, I'm done just saying, it. but if she wants to fix it, then maybe she needs to go, they should go to therapy together and figure out where their issues are. I why don't, they can't why I they don't can't. think that's on the table. I'm just saying both of the thoughts are valid. It depends on what your communication style is and your relationship is with your dad. Mm -hmm. Cause it's so varied and it could be something in between both of you. Yeah. I don't know. It just, both are both. I'm like, yep, that makes sense. Yeah. And I, it does depend on the community, like, the communication level you're at and the relationship you have. Because like if my, like my situation, I lived in Minneapolis. I was two hours away from my bio dad. Um, he would pop up from time to time and ask me to go to dinner. And like, if I was free, I would. If I wasn't, yeah. hey, I'm busy with school. Hey, I'm busy with work. I'm nannying. Like you're an adult. You're not in high school. You're not being forced to visit him. Like if you don't want to visit with him, Hey, sorry, I'm really busy with the project. Hey, I have plans with my friends and you only see him at Christmas. And I will say like the more you brush someone off automatically, the less they're going to reach out. Like Absolutely. that's how it worked for me. Well, or, you know, maybe, maybe it evolves to where there's a change of heart and you see actual effort, actual like, hey, I want to repair this. I want to get better at this. Mm -hmm. And you could see a whole complete change in a relationship down the road. It could happen. It could evolve. Yeah. But naturally getting to this part may not be the most difficult thing. You know, it just may happen kind of naturally over time. It may I, take a couple of years I, I, of doing yeah. it. I really thought that it, when I first opened my mouth to have this discussion, I was really sensing that she, that, or should I, maybe I wasn't sensing, maybe I was trying to profess that maybe you can save your relationship by having a dialogue and making it stronger and making it healthy rather than writing it off. Yeah. And then if you do write it off, it, it got written off because two people saw what it is and said, let's just do this instead. And some people just say, I'm just going to, you know, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. And whatever it is, we'll just, we'll just continue on this path. And it, it you know, it is what it is. Yeah. And, you know, I have a life with my children because I try to communicate with my kids and I, I like communicating with my, with, I like to having conversations. I like to be able to talk to them. I like to have a challenging conversation where we can exercise our minds and both grow. Yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, with, without trying it, how would you know you liked it? <laughs> That's true. And something happened here where it's, you know the the 
the the railroad car went off the tracks. And yeah. I, and Some people just like I think this has come up a lot for like Alejandra and I in recent stories. But some people just don't know how to connect to children. And once they're at an age where they're like 16 or 18 or 20 and they're more of an adult and they feel more relatable. Like, I think that's how it was for me and my dad, where my dad, like when I was in college, the effort did ramp up. And it was more of this, like, I want a relationship with you because you're more relatable. Yeah. That, and I, yeah. I think some people just don't know how to have kids. Mm -hmm. And for whatever it is, like, I would say like, this is really similar to me. Like at 23, I didn't really want anything to do with my dad. I, I did definitely only see him at Christmas. The family reunions have only been the past three years. So mm -hmm. I started going at 25. Yeah. So it definitely can get better if you want it to. And like, I mean, if you see him making an effort, I don't know. It, it just depends on what you want. Like, I don't know. I don't know if you, our listener, feel like you can't have your stepdad and your dad or if you're just like too hurt by your dad um, and growing up and not having him around, which like valid. It sucks. It doesn't feel good. I was just talking about my abandonment issues and insecure attachment style today. Mm -hmm. um, but I just like I don't I sometimes and people might come for me in the comments. They might be like, absolutely not, Morgan. It's unhealthy to not address it you should have the conversation and set the boundary. But I just don't, if you can just have the relationship you want without outright saying, I only want to see you at Christmas. That's it. Don't talk to me. Otherwise don't text me. I just think like I, I, for me in my situation, that wouldn't go well. I, mean, I, I think it could, it could just damage the relationship to where even at Christmas, then it's mm -hmm. awkward and uncomfortable. Um, I could see that. Yeah. I just, I, I don't, definitely see I that. just think like, I think that's a really interesting conversation to have. And if he is blowing you up and calling you and harassing you nonstop and you don't like it, like that might be more of a conversation where it's like, Hey, you know, I don't think you calling me at 10 PM when you've been drinking is great. Like if you could not do that again, I'd love that. If you do it again, no, I won't answer. Like, you're hurting our relationship by acting like that. Like if there's behaviors like that, mm -hmm. but I think outright saying, I only want to see you at Christmas and that's it. I just think it, I don't know if that, I don't know. It's not something I would do. I'll put it that way, but this is your life. So you got I mean, a couple takes. I mean, you, you, you certainly, it, it certainly got to where it, where it is now somehow. And there's a responsibility on why it is where it is. Yeah, well, and that's on him, the dad, you know. And for that, that's where the outcome is, what, what he created. Yeah. Well, and like I know you said you had six sessions because it was free with your insurance, but there there are some very affordable therapy options out there. And therapy is great for learning how to set boundaries. So if this is something you are set on and you feel it's the healthiest and happiest way for you to go about your life, absolutely do it. Fuck what I'm saying and do it. Um, and I would say like a couple more sessions with a therapist about how to establish healthy boundaries and things like that. Yeah, but... I would say the most important thing is that at the end of the day, you have to be comfortable. Since you're thinking about you, you need to be comfortable with that, whatever decision you make. That's the most important thing. Yeah, absolutely. Whatever choice you make, you got to be the one that's comfortable with it. Absolutely. That's it for the night? Christmas is coming up, so I hope it goes well with you and your dad and you get what you want. We've had some impact. We've had three <sighs> impactive stories. And yeah. Typically, we have you know, four. four to six. This was three? This was just three. We were chatty. We got one more for Patreon, though. So do join us on Patreon. We're going to say goodbye for now. We will see you... Uh, right after the New Year's, mm -hmm. and do if you have write-ins for New Year's or for, for the holidays you want to share, share it with us so we can try to kick out six <laughs> rather than three. And, you just got to talk less. Yeah, well, that's what it is. These were important ones. These were these were juicy. Yeah. So Patreon's juicy too. Oh, it's 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 so, juicy. So to get so to get number four. 
come to Patreon. We'll see you there. And thanks again and happy holidays and have a wonderful new year. Happiness, health, and um, prosperity for everybody. That's right. And since we did talk about drunk driving and things, please don't drink and drive. Have a, des a designated driver or be sure you have an Uber planned or a way of getting home where you're going to be staying where you're, where you're enjoying the, the holidays. So please be safe and think about each other and the other people that are on the road and the loved ones that you've left with home that when you're out doing your thing or that might be in the car with you. So let's be smart. Let's really, really, really please, let's be smart for this holiday season. Absolutely. And I love you guys. And uh, I'm so glad you're in my life. And all of you, too, that we're all sharing this. So, yeah. Happy holidays, you guys. And good night. Oh, look at you blinking. And he's flashing. He's flashing us. It yeah. sounds like, it sounds like, it looks like Holly <laughs> wagging her tail. <laughs>